This week on Jerusalem Dateline, stopping the anti-Israel movement worldwide, one painting at a time. We're here to help the communities in need and to turn artists into advocates for Israel. And hundreds of new immigrants arrive to make Israel home, fulfilling biblical prophecy. Plus, an ancient altar dating back to Genesis that could have belonged to the biblical Melchizedek. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. When the anti-Israel boycott, divestment and sanctions movement started creeping into the influential world of street art, one group of renowned artists decided to speak out in their own way. We caught up with Artists for Israel in the southern Israeli town of Sterot. This may look like high-end street art found anywhere in the world, but these American and European artists are on a special mission to Israel. The giant strawberry behind me is actually a bomb shelter. It's part of a project by Artists for Israel to beautify and heal Sterot and other Israeli towns that are often under attack. Artists for Israel started because we saw all of the anti-Israel art that was going on. We noticed that in popular culture, people were doing everything they could to demonize Israel and that they were beginning to move into the young progressive urban contemporary arts category. Craig Dershowitz, co-founder of Artists for Israel, said this group realized they needed to do something. We brought together a bunch of artists 10 years ago to start making pro-Israel art events around New York and since then it's expanded to Israel and across the world. Since then, this community of world-class artists has grown to 8,000, and they've brought more than 100 graffiti artists from 28 countries to encourage Israelis. We're here to, turn, to help the communities in need and to turn artists into advocates for Israel. And no matter what I can tell them, no matter what history I can share, nothing turns them more into advocates than the people who come up and embrace them on the streets. This time, seven artists came to paint in Sterot, a city that's been in the path of thousands of rockets for over 10 years. This school is a school for special needs children. They've had a rocket fall like a few feet away from here and a spray this building with shrapnel. You can see some of the shrapnel damage on the wall. I decided to paint them a big flower just to cover over that, just something beautiful. Jewelry is a Christian who prays over her art. I'm Japanese-American, so this is a Japanese-style flower that we do in Japan, and this is a peony. It represents bravery in battle in Japan, so I put that there. Whenever I put murals on the walls, I always pray on the walls that everybody inside would be protected. In this city of 28,000, each home contains a bomb shelter, plus more than 160 portable ones fill the street. Eric Scottness is painting one of them. It's such a beautiful place and the people are so beautiful, but then there's this, there's this underlying fear that they live in all the time. I wanted to depict uh, King David just being in Israel and, and the heavy religious uh, aspect here. And I just thought it kind of fit on this wall, him looking up to the sky and the heavens. Um, and then the, the design in the background is influenced by Hebrew letters. Scottness, who works in Hollywood, sees this trip as a chance to donate his time for those in need. It fills my, my heart when I see the kids and how they light up when they see, you know, this kind of stuff. Remember the strawberry? Taker One from Hungary painted that first. Now he's working on the cat. It's a bit difficult to imagine a place where sometimes rockets fall. The bomb shelters are weird, but it's a good thing that we get to make them a little colorful. So yeah, I think that's the main point of it, to make these buildings that have a negative connotation to have something positive to them. For people to come to a shelter, it's the mean is that they need to, run, uh, to go to some place to save their life. They need to hide in some place. So many times the, the children and the parents uh, look about the shelter like it's the, you know, it's the dark, it's the dark part of the story. And when you come and you see a cat, you see a, a beautiful picture on the wall, it uh, makes the story a little better. Stero Mayor Alon Davidi came to thank the artists and lend a hand. 
The story of Sderot, it's not a small story, it's a big story, and uh, you part of our family. So thank you very much that you share with us, you stay here a few days. Dershowitz said he'd like to bring more artists to Israel. He's aiming to stop anti-Israel sentiments in places that don't have an opinion before they take hold. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Sderot, Israel. The U.S. State Department is putting a spotlight on the plight of those facing religious persecution, with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo hosting a ministerial conference to advance religious freedom. President Trump heard from more than a dozen victims of religious persecution. CBN's Jenna Browder has that story from Washington. It was an extraordinary and moving scene in the Oval Office as President Trump listened to people from around the world who have been persecuted for their faith. I'm Esther from Nigeria. I do three years in Zambia. I escaped from Boko Haram. This is Nadia, the Nobel yes. Peace Prize winner. I'm from Iraq and uh, I'm, I cannot say my family is there in the jail because when ISIS attack us, no one protect us. After 2003, we start to, to disappear from our area, from our homeland. Uh, when ISIS attack us in 2014, they killed six of my brother. They killed my mom. The president even insisting he had time to hear more stories despite his schedule. I know Thank the you. president has to get on, so I want to... Uh, the, I know, everybody. We could take a couple of Can you? Okay, good. My family are being persecuted in Iran. Um, Iranian people are with you. The majority of Iranian people... Explain what, what is happening in My Iran. parents are pastors, they're Christian pastors. They've been arrested, all my family, my father, my mother, and my brother. They are free on bail, awaiting the trial and long sentences. They've been invited, along with thousands of others, to tell their stories and take part in the Trump administration's initiative to protect and promote religious freedom. You have over 16 countries represented here. You have approximately 27 people, but I was in the room yesterday with thousands, and we had thousands that could not get in. So we thank you, President, for being the leader, um, the courageous leader to stand up not only in our nation, but countries all around for all faith of all people people that we should have the practice and the right to practice our religion. Pastor Paula White referring to the second ministerial on international religious freedom. The State Department says 80 percent of people worldwide live in a religiously restricted environment. All people from every place on the globe must be permitted to practice their faith openly in their homes, in their places of worship, in the public square, and believe what they want to believe. To hear more about the ministerial conference, CBN's chief political analyst, David Brody, sat down with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Secretary of State. Mike Pompeo, great to see you, sir. It's great to see you again, too. Thanks for having me. The ministerial conference, I want to talk about it. Uh, you talk about strategies here, the, some strategies to confront discrimination and tolerance. Uh, what, what can be done at this type of conference here? It's an so important it's, one. It's an important gathering. It's the second time we've had the opportunity to do this. We bring in uh, leaders from all across the world, religious leaders, civil society leaders, government leaders, all aimed singularly uh, at the focus of increasing the capacity uh, for human beings to have the right to worship in the way they want, the way they choose in every country in the world. And we know we're blessed here. It's our first freedom enshrined in, in the U.S. Constitution, uh, but that's not the case everywhere. And our, our mission set is to uh, highlight its importance to educate leaders around the world about how important this is, how it can make your country better and stronger if you'll allow people of every faith to practice their faith, or if they choose not to, fine too. Uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, there's there's uh, small groups that'll gather and talk about particular issues, particular tactics, and then we hope throughout the year, just in this past year, there'll be groups meet all around the world to further this cause. Religious persecution obviously on the rise, but I know the Trump administration has kind of lowered the threshold, if you will, for a number of refugees to get in, about 30,000, I believe, this fiscal year, uh, when it's been about 80,000 maybe in past years. Um, that means more folks that are trying to flee religious persecution aren't able to come into the United States. At least that's what some of the critics would say. What's the response to something like that? You know, we're still the most generous, welcoming nation anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our objective has been uh, to try and do what those people really want in most cases, which is to stay in their own country. 
So our approach for Christians in the Middle East uh, and for other uh, people who are being religiously persecuted around the world, our, our mission set has been to try and create the conditions inside their own country so that they can have that religious freedom. There'll be no need to leave their country, their friends, their people, their church, their synagogue, their mosque, uh, all the things that they know and love and that their grandparents know and love. Uh, and that's our aim. It's one of the purposes of this ministerial this week. I want to ask you a little bit more broadly about foreign policy. I know Joe Biden has been critical. I know that's politics, but Joe Biden's been critical of this administration's foreign policy. Uh, and, and then we have the squad that we hear so much about. A lot of what the president has said, anti-Israel rhetoric coming from uh, these folks. Uh, wh what do you make of that as Secretary of State and what that message sends to folks around the world, especially Israel, and some of our allies? Look, when a, a handful of members of Congress say things that are, um, that are in the tone of the fact that they blame America for so much of the trouble in the world, that, that's deeply troubling. Uh, as I stare at the problem set, whether it's work that we're doing in the Middle East or work we're doing to uh, solve the problem of uh, HIV AIDS in Africa or the reconciliation effort that we're underway with in Afghanistan. I watch America, I watch its motives. We are a force for good in the world, not a force for evil. We're, we, we are not the cause of these conflicts. And I, I hear these members of Congress talk about this as if America had generated this trouble. And to blame America first for these things is deeply inconsistent with uh, not only uh, our founding and our tradition, but with the facts on the ground. Coming up, new immigrants arrive to make Israel home, fulfilling biblical prophecy. Thousands of Jewish people from around the world are expected to immigrate to Israel this summer, fulfilling the words of the biblical prophets. We went to Tel Aviv's international airport when the first plane load arrived. Take a look. A big welcome party awaited 200 new immigrants who arrived in Israel to make the Jewish state their home. It's so crazy, the people here waiting for us, the party, the, the music, the the entire enjoy of, of this is, is magic. I'm always excited when I see new immigrants coming on Aliyah to Eretz Israel, to the ancient homeland. Isaac Herzog is chairman of the Jewish Agency, the organization responsible for Aliyah, or immigration, to Israel. They're all here in one big event which epitomizes the great plight of the Jewish people in their return to their ancient homeland. These are the first arrivals on special flights this summer. They came from France, Russia and Latin America. This year we'll have 30,000 immigrants from 40 countries. It's an incredible story. Among the newcomers are Brazilian and Argentinian singles. I'm an actress so I want to try to work with that. Uh, I'm also a makeup artist, so I came with that idea. Here, I'm going to study Hebrew in Kibbutz Magan Michael, and then I'll be in the army for a year and a half. And then, like all Israelis, I will travel, and then I'll return to study music in Jerusalem. First, I want to really learn Hebrew, okay, so I'm going to do Ulpan, in, very intensive right now. Then, well, I will start searching job as a scientist. They came for different reasons. When I was little, I was living here with my family for, for a while, like four months. And I fell in love with this country and the people and the culture. So I always want to come back here. The economic situation is really great. OK, neighborhood countries are not the best things, but I don't have to worry when I walk through the streets really here. And I came to Israel because I'm a Zionist. I love Israel and I'm hoping to make it my home. Abraham Shevelin from Ohio has been here for just one week. He came back to the airport to welcome the newcomers. I'm learning some Hebrew back in America. I'm good at language. Thankfully, I'm very good at languages. I speak Chinese fluently. I plan on doing business with China and Israel. And if I can do Chinese, I can hopefully do Hebrew, right? Many would see their arrival as the fulfillment of God's word when he said he would regather Israel and plant them in their land. Up next, an archaeologist uncovers an ancient altar from the time of Genesis. Could it be where Melchizedek worshipped God?
An Israeli archaeologist has uncovered the remains of an altar dating back to Genesis. It's believed to be from around the time Abraham met the high priest Melchizedek in Jerusalem. The discovery took place in the city of David, the original Jerusalem near the Temple Mount and outside the walls of the old city. Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell brings us details of this key find. Archaeologist Eli Shukron has spent much of his life looking for Bible history in the city of David. He showed us an area he believes dates back 4,000 years and includes everything necessary for animal sacrifice and worship. In this room, what we have, we have the platform. Mm -hmm. On that platform, it was an altar and the channel taking all the blood and all the other going out mm -hmm. from the altar and you collect it here in this place. In this series, he gave CBN News an exclusive look at what he feels is one of his most important discoveries kept under lock and key. If we came here, we can see that this is very, very important finding because this is the heart of the place. This is the pillar. So Krun says this stone pillar is just like the one described in Genesis 28 when Jacob had a dream of a ladder reaching up to heaven in Bethel. After the dream, Jacob said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. Shukron believes Melchizedek set this stone up in Jerusalem, just like Jacob did in Bethel. What I am saying, worshiping God the same way like Jacob. Or oh, Jacob worshiping God the same way like Melchizedek. We are in a very, very important place. Go back to Melchizedek, go back to Abraham time. Understand which way these people worshiping God in the beginning. Sukran says it contrasts with ancient worship in other places. If you go in that time to other places in the world, in Egypt or in Mesopotamia, you can see the temples with gold and mm -hmm. idols and I don't know, pillars and uh, here it's simple, mm. the stone. Animal, sacrifice, the stone is the house of God, not gold and diamond. Everything is simple. Yeah, yeah. This is what God wants us, to be simple. It's fantastic. For what? What reason? To connect mm. it with God. Sukran says the combination of the altar for sacrifice, the blood channel, the olive press for anointing oil, place to tie up the sacrificial animals, where they divided the sacrifice, lead him to believe this was the place where Melchizedek met Abraham. Genesis 14 describes the meeting. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. He blessed Abram with bread and wine. And Abraham gave him a tie. Why Abraham gave him a tie? Because mm. he was worshiping God. A tradition and way of life that continues some 4,000 years later. What are you doing today? The Jewish, the Christian, we're blessing the bread and wine. Different way, but blessing bread and wine. And we're anointed. What all that started? Here in the city of David in the temple of Melchizedek. This is the place. Sukran says this area was closed to make room for another place of worship. They filled it, they closed it. Why? Because no more worshiping area. Let's go focus to Mount Moriah, to the temple that, that Solomon built on Mount Moriah. Sukran sees this area as predating the temples of Solomon and Herod on the Temple Mount by hundreds of years. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the City of David, Jerusalem. Still ahead, how Christians are helping new immigrant families to settle in Israel. As we showed you earlier, it's exciting for Jewish people to return to the land and make Israel their home. But adjusting to life here isn't always easy. Here's a story about how CBN is helping new immigrants. When Russia invaded Donetsk, Ukraine, the Boston family found themselves in the middle of the fight. It happened all at once. 
with soldiers running to the streets and machine guns firing. It was like a nightmare. We had no choice but to flee this place to protect our two daughters. I could hear the bombs at the edge of Donetsk. I was scared for my whole family. I thought about our daughters' futures, and I dreamt of holding my grandchildren one day. So we ran. Igor and Nanel quickly loaded two suitcases with what they could and fled the city with their daughters. Because they're Jewish, the Bosans immigrated to Israel. We had no idea what it would be like starting a new life in Israel. We couldn't speak the language, and we moved into an empty apartment with nothing. With no money to even buy appliances, the family was in dire need. We lost faith. I felt like a motherless child. Then Ninel met a man in her Hebrew class who told her CBN Israel could help. She contacted us and we gave the family a brand new refrigerator, stove and washing machine. Now we feel like we are protected and at home here. Thanks to you, we feel like somebody cares about us. Before we came here, I didn't know CBN Israel existed or that you would simply give us everything we needed. Both Igor and Ninel are working now and the girls are doing well in school. Because of CBN Israel, the Bosans have gotten a fresh start. I want to say thanks to all those who are helping not only us, but others in need. You set a very good example for how people are supposed to care for each other. Thank you very much. You do not just give financial support, but hope to people who are starting over with nothing. Everything will be okay now. I believe we have a good future. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And remember, the God that's watching over Israel, and you and me, neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.